I'm going to share some thoughts from Psalm 25, and I'm going to read verses 4 to 7, but I encourage you uh, to find some time to just read through the whole psalm and to think about how you can uh, make it your declaration, your prayer. See, King David wrote this psalm when he was struggling with life, when he was battling uh, with things within himself as well as outside of himself. And in that wrestling, he declares his decision to continue trusting God. And he asks God for wisdom, direction, protection, and for help. So here's verses four to seven. Show me your ways, Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me, for you are God my saviour. In And my hope is in you all day long. Remember, Lord, your great love and mercy, your mercy and love, for they are from of old. Do not remember the sins of my youth and my rebellious ways. According to your love, remember me, for you, Lord, are good. And David's problems are much like our own. That's why we can relate to this psalm so easily. They're external problems and internal problems. And in verses 3, And verse 17, he speaks about his enemies, those who hate him and betray him. Like us, he lived in a hostile, imperfect world, which meant that in spite of his high position as king, he was also susceptible to danger and unexpected attacks from others. Those were some of the external problems that he faced. But in verses 7 and 11, he also speaks of internal problems, his sins, Just like us, his enemy could sometimes be himself and he needed deliverance from himself as much as he did from his external enemies. Sometimes those external and internal battles can just seem too much, too overwhelming. And that's what provokes this psalm, which is both a declaration of a decision to trust in God as much as it is a prayer to God for him to hear those inner cries of anguish and to come to his aid. This is a psalm for us when we're asking much the same questions as David. Questions like, where is the solid ground that I can stand on? Uh, In this world of shifting sand where it's unclear who's telling the truth, who or what can I put my trust in? Where people say one thing but do another and where I can't even trust myself to be consistent. How can I get my bearings and How can I keep my head above water and how can I stand firm? With those problems and questions, David the psalmist declares in verses 1 to 3, In you, Lord, my God, I put my trust. I trust in you. Don't let me be put to shame, nor let my enemies triumph over me. No one who hopes in you will ever be put to shame. David says, I place my trust in you, God, my God. There are reasons he gives for doing that. Firstly, here in verse 3, no one who hopes in God will ever be put to shame or disgraced. Hoping in God will never prove to be vain. Even when we have to wait for the results of that trust, it will surely come. The ultimate end results of trusting God is glory, not shame. Secondly, David places his trust in God because of who God is, because of his dependable character. Verse 6, remember, Lord, your great mercy and love, for they are from from of old. David isn't trusting God because of some idle, fleeting promise God has made, but because God's merciful and loving nature have been his from the beginning of time. God's unchanging character has a track record. God is love. He always has been and now and will always be love. He wasn't... He wasn't any different in the Old Testament. There's no difference in his character between the Old and the New Testaments. He's an unchanging and dependable God throughout. When Israel had broken the commandments and the tablets, uh, the, the Ten Commandments had originally been written on, had been smashed, Moses chiseled out a new pair of stone tablets with the same words that God had uh, given uh, the first time. And he went up with them up the mountain to meet with God and God in his mercy was giving Israel a second chance. 
Exodus 34, 5-7, Then the Lord came down in the cloud and stood there with him and proclaimed his name, the Lord. And he passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. Yet he doesn't leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. Just listen to the weight given to justice and to mercy. Those who've sinned will be punished to the third and fourth generation, but he also forgives wickedness, rebellion and sin and maintains love to thousands. God's self-declaration was that he's the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. And that statement is repeated throughout the Old Testament. And then it's proved to be true in the New Testament when sin was punished by God on the cross so that God could forgive the wickedness, rebellion and sin of all who turn to him for help so that he can lavish his love, compassion and grace on us in spite of our sins. David says, I will put my trust in you because of who you are and who you will always be. When I'm wondering who I can really trust, I know I can throw my lot in with you, God, and you won't let me down. Psalm 146 verses 3 to 6 say, Do not put your trust in princes, in human beings who can't save. When their spirit departs, they return to the ground, and on that very day their plans come to nothing. Blessed are those whose help is in the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord their God. He is the maker of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them. He remains faithful forever. Princes are meant to be the best example of mankind. They have power and influence and they should also have integrity. Many of those world leaders who could have displayed these qualities have proved to be just the opposite, greedy and self-serving. But even the best of them, as the psalm says here, will return to the ground. Even those who had the best of intentions may not be able to carry out their good plans and follow those plans through. God is the only one who can truly save. He's the eternal one, and so he's able to be faithful to his promises forever. He's able to follow through. Psalm 20 verse 7 says, Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. It's not just people that we may mistakenly put our trust in. We're also tempted to trust in material things. Chariots and horses were war machines of the time, but we're also tempted to trust in anything that pretends to provide us with any kind of security. A job, our bank balance, a retirement plan, a house, an expensive car, an iPad Pro, a new TV, a holiday villa. These are all the kind of things that we try to find our comfort in to replace finding our true satisfaction and peace in God. And when we look to these things in that way, they become idols. The psalmist declares that some trust in those things, but we have chosen to put our trust in the name that is the person and the character of the Lord our God. Our world's littered with the results of those who've put their trust in material things and live selfish lives in order to secure those things and to hold on to them for themselves. Along with those selfish desires comes the need to justify that ungodly way of living. Where there's injustice, there's always also a lack of complete honesty. And that dishonesty is something which over the last few years seems to have been so much more prevalent and pervasive in our world as it's been amplified so much through traditional and social media. The confusion, propaganda and the fake news causes, I believe, um, a lot of the mental health problems that we're seeing today. And it's something which highlights the need for us to adopt the principles that David expressed here in Psalm 25. The problem of knowing what is true and what can be relied on is not a new problem. It's just been amplified through 
bigger technology, the bigger technological megaphones of our time. About 700 years before Jesus was born, Isaiah wrote words which seem so contemporary. Isaiah 59 says, because of sinfulness, a turning away from God, a rebellion against him, um, justice is driven back. These are verses 14 to 15 of Isaiah 59. Justice is driven back and righteousness stands at a distance. Truth has stumbled in the streets. Honesty cannot enter. Truth is nowhere to be found. And whoever shuns evil becomes a prey. And God declared through the prophet Isaiah in the next few verses that he looked around to see if there was anyone who was completely honest, completely true, anyone who could be relied on to carry out his will on the earth. And he saw that there was no one at all and he was appalled. And so he chose to step in and intervene himself in order to bring salvation and justice. He would redeem his people through a Messiah, his anointed one. The suffering servant that Isaiah speaks about in chapter 53. He was the only one full of integrity and truth. The perfect spotless lamb without even the tiniest character spot or wrinkle. When truth and justice completely failed and collapsed in the streets, God presented us with his son Jesus. The only one who could fully, uh, who we could fully trust and rely on. He steps into the darkness as the light of the world. And he declared of himself, I am the way, the truth and the life. Well, when we're not sure which way to go, we can look to him. He is the truth, full of integrity and completely trustworthy. Trusting in him is the path of life. The cries of David in Psalm 25, born out of his anguish over the antagonism he experienced in the world, his frustrations with his own sinfulness and his need for a place and a person to focus on and settle his trust in. You know, all of those cries are fully met in Jesus. Our same frustrations and angst are also met in Jesus. Jesus is ultimately what our hearts long for and cry out for. He's the one we can fully rely on, fully trust in. The dependable one who will never lie to us or tell us half-truths. The one who will always act with complete integrity towards us. The one who is full of mercy, compassion, love and grace. The one who gives us a safe place to stand in the storms of life. In all the external turmoil of hatred, selfishness and injustice and in all of the internal struggles we have with our own sinful nature. All those who honestly want to find this ultimate truth, God's truth, will find it in Jesus. After his arrest, as he stood before Pilate, Jesus said, this is John 18 verse 37, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. Well, Pilate retorted cynically, what is truth? And then he went out to the Jews who'd gathered, um, saying that he found no charge against Jesus. And he asked if they wanted him to release Jesus to them. But the crowd shouted back for the criminal Barabbas to be released instead. Jesus was testifying and was in himself a testimony to the truth and all those who desired truth would find it in him is what he said but Pilate cynical about the truth played the political game making out that he would be happy to release Jesus and letting the choice be made by the antagonistic antagonistic crowd he shifts the responsibility off himself to imply his own innocence just like a modern world leader or politician And unfortunately, just like us, when we don't make Jesus our reference point for truth, when we fail to act like David in Psalm 25, when we don't choose to trust in God or look to him for his guidance, truth and direction, when we fail to act with integrity and and truth stumbles and falls, not only in the streets, but also in us. The solution for us, our salvation, our healing, our integrity, our wholeness, our security, our safety is found in David's declarations and prayers, which should lead us directly to Jesus. 
David doesn't even trust in himself. Instead, he trusts himself. He entrusts himself to the only one he and we can truly rely on. God alone is the rock of our salvation. Merciful, loving, good, upright, trustworthy, faithful and true. Our redeemer, our teacher, our guide, our protector, our refuge. Our place of safety in a broken, shaking world for broken, shaken lives to find peace. And this is all in Psalm 25. I urge you again to read it all through and make David's declarations and prayers your own. As I end, I'm going to just read some of those words and ask you um, that if you'll be prepared to just declare and pray them with me as I read them out. Will you do that and firmly choose to find your strength and help and confidence and safety and salvation in God? Let's declare with David. In you, Lord my God, I put my trust. I trust in you because no one who trusts in you will ever regret it. And let's pray as David prayed. Show me your ways, Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me. For you are God, my saviour, and my hope is in you all day long. Let's trust in his forgiveness, mercy and love, not in our own imperfect efforts as we pray these words as well. Remember, Lord, your great mercy and love for they are from of old. Do not remember the sins of my youth and my rebellious ways. According to your love, remember me. For you, Lord, are good. Amen.